Good morning, everybody, members and members of the Good public morning. who are joining us today, and all the officers and Paul from Yorkshire Water. We hope everybody's keeping well and keeping safe. So I'd like to welcome to the uh, Scarborough Whitby Area Constituency, Constituency Committee meeting today, the virtual one. Uh, it's via Teams and it's Friday, 6th of November, and we're starting at 10.01. So good morning, everybody. So we'll go straight into the agenda and it's minutes of the meeting held on 16th of September. Um, is it OK for members for these minutes to be signed off? Yeah, agreed. OK, agreed. thank you. Uh, apologies for absence. I've not received any, Chair. OK, thank you. Declarations of interest. Thank you. Public questions or statements? Do you intend, uh, there are none. No, just none. Okay, thank you. So we'll go straight on to uh, Paul Carter uh, from Yorkshire Water. Um, he's going to do a presentation for us this morning and we wait for the presentation to be finished and then uh, questions can be asked. Uh, so Paul, straight over to yourself and thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll just share my presentation. Hopefully you can all see that. Um, can you see the presentation? Yeah, I can. Yeah. Good. Thank you. So um, I've been asked here this morning to give you an update on Yorkshire Water's environmental performance. Um, so members of the committee right, might remember that um, I think it was back in January. I came to present um, a previous update on our environmental performance. So this is um, what's called the environmental performance assessment, which is an annual assessment that the Environment Agency does of all the water and sewerage companies in England. Um, it's been around for uh, nine years now, and the way that it works is that um, they publish an annual assessment. So it's based on a calendar year assessment. Um, so last time I came, I came to talk to you about our 2018 performance assessment, which was published in 2019. Um, and today I'll give you an update on our performance from 2019, which was only published back in September because it was delayed. Normally they're published in July, but it was delayed due to COVID. So um, we're a bit behind in terms of the, the kind of performance assessment that's being published. It's, it's a little bit um, old, but I'll give, give you an update on where we are so far this year as well. So just to explain a little bit more about what the environment performance assessment covers, it covers pollution incidents, so that's the total number of pollution incidents, the number of serious pollution incidents, it covers how, what percentage of pollution incidents are re reported by water companies directly to the environment agency compared to those that are reported by members of the public. So the idea being that the Environment Agency prefer if we report those um, directly to them rather than them coming in from elsewhere. Um, it looks at the performance of our sewage treatment works and our, um, and our water treatment works. It looks at how well we're doing in terms of delivering our environmental performance uh, scheme. So work that we're doing to improve the environment, whether that's improving wastewater treatment, whether it's some of the river improvement schemes that we're doing and various other things. And finally, it looks at the what's called the security of supply index, which is just how, um, how we're doing in managing water resources and ensuring that we've got a long term supply of water for the region. So it looks at all these different measures and then at the end, um, it gives you a performance rating, out a star rating, which is out of four stars. So um, the highest you can get, obviously, four stars is industry leading, three stars is good, two stars is poor, and um, I, I can't remember the exact wording for one star, but it's just effectively it's it's um, unacceptable. Um, so that's that's just how it works. Um, if you might remember uh, when I came to the committee back in January, um, it was to talk about the publication of the Environmental Performance Assessment in 2018, which had been which had gone down from three stars to two stars, um, which was unacceptable performance. And I think that's that's part of the reason why the committee asked me to come and present. Um, we the, the, that poor performance was largely driven by an increase in the number of serious pollution incidents 
which was partly a function of of things that had gone wrong unacceptably, partly also a function of the fact that 2018 was exceptionally dry. So when pollution incidents were happening, they were happening into watercourses that were already um, lower in level. So the ecological impact was much greater. So um, so that was partly why there were more serious pollutions because they were the pollutions that did happen had a greater impact because because we were going through such a dry period. So if you recall at the time, I, I, I think we, we were very clear that um, the performance in 2018 was not acceptable. We didn't, you know, we were we were not wanting to be a poor, a poor rated company. We did not want two stars. And we'd already, by the time I came to talk to you, put in place a number of measures that um, that we hoped would improve our performance. So a large part of that was around investing a lot more money in the visibility of our network. So. If you think about our our water network, our clean water network, we've got um, because of the nature of it is um, pumped. You know, the large majority of the network is pumped and pressurized. We've got a lot of visibility of that network because we've got a lot of pumps. We've got monitoring all of those. We can see everything that's happening because the sewer network is much more op- is operates much more on gravity rather than pumping there's less visibility of what's going on in the sewer network which gave us which gives us less visibility of things that could go wrong which means we can't necessarily intervene as quickly as we might want to and that sometimes leads to pollution incidents so what we've done is we've spent a lot of money on putting in much uh, getting greater visibility of our sewer network putting in sensors across the network really trying to help us predict where issues might arise where pollution incidents might occur um, we spent about 50 million pounds on improvements around pollution to try and help improve that performance. We've also been doing a lot of work around education and speaking to communities because a lot of issues that come from the sewer are due to inappropriate things being flushed down the toilet. So flushing of wet wipes and things that might say flushable on the packet, but that doesn't mean that they're biodegradable. It doesn't mean that they break down in the sewer. When it says flushable on the packet, all it means is that it gets past the, the U-bend in your toilet, but then it will sit in the sewer and it will attract other things and it causes blockages. So we've done a lot of work around informing communities about what's the right thing to do around that, avoiding putting fat soils and greases down sinks and things like that. And where we've put a lot of effort into that, we've seen some real improvements as well. So it's been a been a bit of a twin track approach really around the pollution stuff, particularly in terms of educating people, but also making sure that we've got that visibility of our network, we've got our assets in order, and that we know everything that's happening on that network. So when I came to talk to you in January, we were looking, um, things were looking up in terms of our our performance. Um, And so this is where we got to for 2019's environmental performance assessment, which is which was published in September this year. So it was delayed from July. Um, So as you'll see, we've got improvements there, particularly in terms of the serious pollution incidents. Um, So these pollution incidents are, um, that's not the total of incidents, that's the number per 10,000 kilometres of sewer because it's done across the industry to to normalise it across there. So as you can see, we've moved from being a a poor two-star company in 2018 to being a good three-star company in 2019. So that means, you know, the work that we've done has started to pay off. We've seen some of the improvements come through into that performance assessment there. So this is, it might be a little tricky to see this slide, but we can send it around afterwards. This is the performance across the whole of the water industry um, in, in 2019. So two companies, Seven Trent and Wessex got a four star rating. Four companies, including ourselves, were rated three stars. We had three companies that got two star ratings and one company, uh, which is Southern Water, got a one star rating. So it's still a mixed picture across the industry in terms of how performance is going. Um, locally, we are at least imp- on the on the upward trend uh, and where in- things are improving. So we're, we're kind of middle of the pack, really, at the moment, I would say, in terms of our performance, looking at this 2019 uh, report. So, as I said, um, 
it's done on a the environmental performance assessment is done on an annual calendar year basis a lot of our other measures are done on financial year but this is a, an, a calendar year measure so we are now you know we're into november now so we're we're quite a way through the 2020 performance year so we can see how uh, how things are going um the performance annual performance assessment for this year won't be published until probably middle of next year but we can we can show you here how we're doing so far so as you can see that the improvement in performance has continued from 2019 into 2020 so we're now looking at um we're on track for being a four star leading company when the next report is published so that's obviously really positive from our point of view that we've gone from being poor in 2018 we put the measures in place we've reacted quickly we've seen that improvement go up to good in 2019 and all being well if everything goes to plan for the rest of this year we'll have moved up to being a four star company be a leading company when when the next performance assessment comes out so as you can see we've um, we've got improvements across all categories there um, in terms of our performance which despite which i think is particularly impressive from our operational colleagues in spite of the the challenges that they faced this year so obviously we've had to change some of our working patterns and some of our working practices due to covid to make sure that we're keeping our our colleagues safe and that we've some for a period at the beginning of the pandemic we we stopped doing uh, customer visits into customers homes because we wanted to make sure that customers and colleagues were kept safe we've now got processes in place that allow us to do those but obviously we've been through a, a challenging period operationally in terms of having to change what we do and yet we've actually still seen uh, improvements across the board in performance and if you can you can see from the serious pollutions that we're now this year we're about half the rate of last year which itself was nearly half the rate of the year before so we've come down quite significantly in, in that regard so really positive performance this year um, despite the challenges and all being well we're, we're on the edge of leading so you know, some, some changes could mean that we do end up with with good next year but um but hopefully we'll end up with, with a four star leading company so i think the only other thing really that i wanted to just uh, cover is that um in terms of the environmental performance assess assessment from next year from the 1st of january the a new methodology is being introduced by the environment agency which basically increases the thresholds of what you need to achieve to get the higher ratings so if you think that this year we were on track for a three star good good performance if we had that performance in 2021 we would be rated as poor um, because it's getting more challenging so that obviously is pushing us to continue that upward trend of performance so that it means that we can't say you know we, we end up with leading this year and we can't just sit back and relax and, and think that everything's going to be fine we need to continue to push to perform even better so the first performance assessment under this new methodology will be the year of 2021 but it won't be published till mid 2022 so it'll be a little while before we see the results and how that works out but it does mean that you know we we've got to work really really hard to keep this improvement in performance up and you know there's we're we're working really hard to do that we've still got lots of improvement plans that we're putting in place um and we want to you know we want to be one of the leading companies in the industry in terms of our environmental performance so things are going well it's going to get continually more challenging um, but um, hopefully I think the main message is really that compared to when I spoke to you last when we were explaining why we were seeing unacceptable performance and and what we were going to be doing to to address that we have come quite a way in terms of um, what we've managed to achieve so um, that was really all I had in terms of um, providing you with an update um, from where we were um, when I came to you last but obviously there there's lots of other stuff going on from a Yorkshire water point of view um, and there's there's lots more that we can talk about I'm happy to take questions on obviously any of any of the stuff that I've covered or as much as I can anything else that you've got questions in terms of Yorkshire water issues thank you very much Paul
Um, and can, do, can I just say, yes, from two years ago, you've made um, strong leaps forward and, and, and it's good to see um, that it is improving and where you are today. And hopefully you can meet those challenges um, for the next stage up to good. So uh, I wish you luck on that and, um, and, and thank you to everybody involved in, in making sure that it is advancing a better stay better way than we were two years ago so thank you for that um i've got three members who wish to speak at the moment councillor jefferson first then we'll go on to councillor anderson and councillor chance thank you thank you chairman and thank you paul for an excellent presentation when we had the last meeting um public meeting i did ask you about the bathing water quality i know it's not maybe included in these stats but the South Bay, I'm just concerned about it because some of the ratings are still not coming through as they should do, as I have the responsibility for harbours. I just wondered if you could update on anything to do with that, if that's all right, Chairman. Uh, that's fine, uh, Councillor Jefferson. Uh, Paul, could you take the um, presentation down, please? Thank you. Um, OK, um, I thought I had, but let me see. <laughs> Um, is that okay now? Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, bathing water. Um, the bathing water sampling programme that would normally take place over the summer um, from the Environment Agency was reduced this year, partly because <clears throat> for the start of the year, the Environment Agency weren't doing any sampling um, due to COVID. They then carried out reduced frequency sampling at certain sites so sites where bathing water is good like whitby um they uh, it was less frequent but scarborough still received frequent sampling now we should have the results of this year's bathing water samples next week or the week after that's what we would normally expect in terms of bathing water results would normally come second week of november um we, we're still not sure whether that will will end up being delayed because of covid um as a lot of things are at the moment um but th so we're still waiting to see where where scarborough south and the others are this year in terms of the ratings i think one thing that we have been doing this year is we've funded uh, a, a one million pound investigation into scarborough south bathing water which will allow us to predict build a predictive model which looks at all the different factors that uh, impacting bathing water and allows us to test different interventions and different things that, that could help to improve that because obviously we've we've been working together as a bathing water partnership for for many years now uh, in terms of working with the local authority we work in the environment agency with the the investment that we've put in um, and whilst we've seen some improvements in places in Scarborough it's obviously been not been able to get past that poor rating and so whilst we've done investigations that have found a number of different causes um, that are impacting that we, we really need to I think this model will help us further refine that help us further um, put more measures in place that might be able to address that and I've spoken to my, my colleague who's leading the bathing water work and she said she's more than happy to come and give a specific presentation on on bathing water to the uh, to the committee if that would be something of interest um, obviously they can she can then go into more of the kind of technical detail about the work that we've been doing um, so if that's something that you would like I'm happy to arrange that thank you very much Paul that would be very very beneficial thank you Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, thank you, uh, Councillor Jefferson. And yes, we'll take you up on that offer, uh, Paul. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Anderson. Yeah, yeah thanks, uh, Chair. Yes, again, Paul, thanks for the presentation. Uh, it certainly all, all looks good on your graphs and on paper, but as always, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Um, I'd just like to refer back again, and members will be getting sick of me raising this, but I'm uh, determined to get to the bottom of it all eventually, and that's the long sea outfall at Wheat, at wheat Croft uh, from the potato plant. Um, what 
further discussions have taken place regarding this problematic area because there is it's still a problem. There's still um, uh, concerns and complaints coming in regarding uh, the standard of the water out there, especially from the, the surface that go out there and the, those that paddle on the surface, uh, on the surfboards, um, that there's still a problem area uh, where the uh, uh, outfall ends. Um, you talk about measures have been put in, into place to improve the bathing water. Has this also been taken into consideration? I know talks were going to uh, uh, take in place and, um, with the uh, potato company, and they did have, for a time, a discharge permit compliance certificate, but it was, a, if my memory says me, me correctly, it was a temporary one. And then they had to reapply. Could you speak to us today, Paul, on that, please? Thanks, Chair. Um, I, I'll have to come back to you on some of the detail around the the, com the compliance certificate and where where they are in terms of the permitting around that. I can I, I'll uh, I'll get you an update on that specifically. Um, I know that the, the work that's gone on before the investigations into bathing water and the impact of the the Wheatcroft outfall have found that. The, the impact the impact on bathing water is occasional and kind of a transient impact and it's not necessarily the biggest impact on bathing water. However, I think what will help is this extra investigation that we've got going on now will help us to really kind of pin that down a little bit more because I think we found that there there is it has an impact some of the time. Um, I think that's what the investigation shows, but it's not all of the time. So it's not it's not the contributing factor to to why Scarborough South is poor. But obviously there are there are issues that need that we need to understand better. Um, and I think I know that we've been having ongoing conversations with McCain's around um, how that you know how we can improve um, how that operates, whether some of their process improvements on their site can help to improve the effluent that comes out of there, anything else that can be done um, to help kind of address that issue. Um, again, I think probably the best thing to do is specifically when uh, when we come back and talk about bathing water, we can make sure that we cover the whole permit um, issue in, in much more detail because I, I know that's 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 probably something that's out is outside of my area of specialism so i don't want to get anything wrong um so i think it's probably better to say things are ongoing we have had we're ongoing conversations we're doing more investigation work but i'll be able to get you a, a more detailed update from from my colleague when we come specifically to talk about bathing water that's fine paul thanks for that i appreciate it uh thank you councillor anderson um and uh, Melanie, maybe we can put that uh, one for the March meeting because uh, it is an important issue and uh, it's probably the good timing for it to be coming along. Uh, thank you for that. Um, thanks, thanks, Chairman. Appreciate that as well. Uh, Councillor Chance. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, it's, it's a very local one for me uh, in so far as... Um, we, we had we had an ongoing problem for years with stairs and we we then deregulated the beach uh, and uh, uh, so the samples aren't taken but we still have a major problem at stairs and that is whenever we get uh, heavy rain we get sewerage solids coming up through the street drains uh, and, and that that gives me grave concern i just wonder if anything is being done to address that or if there's any monitoring going on um i'll i'll come back to you with with a more specific update on on exactly what's happening at stairs but i think there is um there is definitely an issue around um we're seeing much more across the region actually everywhere with with the impact of climate change and the more heavy rain that we're getting we're seeing an impact from this where we where we've got combined networks so where we've got foul and surface water networks combined that um as, as we get more severe storms, more heavy rain, that there is an increasing need to be able to separate out those systems because we, we're finding that the pressure relief valves that we've got on the system, so the combined sewer overflows and things like that, are operating much more frequently because we're getting those heavier storms. So there's much work as we can do as possible to separate out surface water and sewage, the better. Um, because it means that you don't have um, don't have issues like that. Um, but I think 
so that's looking at thing, much more things like natural flood management, sustainable drainage to keep rainwater out of the network. And that's something that we're doing across the region. And I think that is, again, and specifically, I'll come back to you with more detail around stays and, and what's being done on that particular part of the network. But that is a, an area where we do need to address that that pressure that gets put on by by rainfall. So I think there's a there's a challenge across the whole industry. There's a challenge that we recently put to um, we got our final what's called our final determination from off what where we put in our business plan for the period 2025 to 20 uh, uh, to 2020 to 2025. They gave us a final determination of what the, what we were allowed to spend, what customer bills would be. And we've actually challenged that with the Competition and Markets Authority on the basis that we want to be able to spend more on long term resilience on addressing exactly things like that of separating out surface water by improving uh, the river water quality by meaning that we're not having those spills into rivers. And so I think that, and that's subject to challenge that's ongoing at the moment, but that's definitely an area that we want to do more on. I'll have to come back to you specifically about the exact details of, of stairs and I'll, I'll, I'll either write to you or we can uh, we can um, come up with an update soon. I'd appreciate that. Thanks very much. Uh, it's it stairs lane that is the biggest problem. OK. Um, thank you, Councillor Chance, and thank you, Paul, for that. And if possible, um, uh, it will be interesting for all members to get that feedback from yourself as well. What's happening in stairs? Um, that would be very helpful if you could do that too, please. I will do that, yeah. Um, I can't see any other members wishing to speak. Um, is there anybody else? Last call for any other speakers, please. No, that's fine then. Thank you very much, Paul, for coming along this morning and I hope you keep safe and thanks to everybody involved uh, in making where we are today, especially yes, in these hard times we're in. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, so we'll go on to the next agenda item. Um, but I, I, before we do, actually, I, I do apologise. I should have put uh, uh, the leader, uh, Car, uh, Councillor Carl Les, apologies in. He had to attend another meeting. Normally he's attending these meetings, but unfortunately he's busy this morning. So we'll go on to agenda item number six, uh, which was brought to this meeting from the last meeting because we ran out of time. Um, so it's schools educational achievement and finance. So I think, is it Matt who's going to lead on this? Uh, hello Chair, yeah, it's, um, I'm standing in for Andrew Dixon today, Strategic Planning Manager. Um, I'm Matt George, I'm Strategic Planning Officer for Scarborough, Whitby and Rydell. Uh, I think members will probably be familiar with the format of this report it's something that we we bring periodically uh, to, to the committee um, and it's to inform members about the local educational landscape achievement and financial challenges that are going on it's quite a, a wide-ranging report and uh, sort of uh, gives a hopefully a broad overview of the issues in the area um, I'm not intending to go through each section and through all of the details um, because I think members will have had a chance to look at it. I've got colleagues from uh, from the various areas of CYPS here who, and we're more than happy to answer any specific questions about the areas. I've got um, Sally Dunn and Howard Emmett from, from Finance, Assistant Director and Head of Finance, Julie Patterson uh, as Principal Advisor for Education Skills and uh, Carol Ann Howe who's the Head of Inclusion. Um, yeah, we're, we're, we're more than happy to answer any questions on, on on the issues raised in the report. Okay, thank you. I hope members have uh, read the part we the report. We've had it quite some time now uh, from the last meeting. Um, so, if I may kick off, please. Um, I've got a couple of questions, really. Um, and if uh, officers or staff come in to answer any questions, please could you say who you are um, for the public sake? Thank you very much. Um, and I think it's on 511, I think it's, it's uh, and while I welcome East Whitby West Cliff Academy has been approved for I think CNI and SEMH and, and numbers rising for social, emotional, mental health, is there a similar provision to carry this on in more than one secondary school? Um, and obviously more than the two primary schools, because I think it's important where we are today um, 
that we make sure this happens uh, for a lot of people because the numbers are rising. I'm very concerned of this one. And um, the more we can do to help on this uh, on this side of things, the, the better for us. And that's another reason why less disruption we have in whatever way we go in the unitary side of things, um, we've got to make sure there's no disruption in this because things are going to get tough. They're tough now, but they're going to get tougher. And this is a really concern for me. I'll leave that question there uh, for it to be answered. And I've got another question as well. Hi, I think I can take that one. It's Caroline Howe, Head of Inclusion. Um, I can't turn my camera on, I'm afraid. I don't know why, but I hope you can hear me. So, um, so just to pick that one up. Um, yes, um, we are really pleased we've got East Whitby and West Cliff up and running. And even though um, during um, full lockdown, um, when most schools were closed over the summer, um, we've been working really hard with those schools to get them on track and opening. Um, so they're, they're absolutely um, on track and ready to go. We hope that in the next couple of years, we'll have 31 similar provisions across the local authority. So covering both communication and interaction and social, emotional, mental health. And absolutely, Councillor, I share your concerns about the growth um, in social, emotional, mental health and children's well-being at the moment. Um, our so we've got a cohort of schools that are ready to be um, to start opening in the next year across the county, and we still do have some opportunities for schools to come forward to volunteer to be part of this provision. And I guess that's the only um, that's the next step councillors may be able to help us with is promoting that opportunity to schools that maybe they're involved with or it's on the governing body of. Um, there's still some opportunities for schools to come forward. Um, when schools do, we're supporting them with an awful lot of training, skilling up, um, helping them review their, their premises to make sure that it is successfully due. So they're not, not unsupported at all. Um, so that would be something that would be really helpful. We do have some more slots. Right, thank you for that, uh, for the answer as well. And obviously, um, it's not just that point I've raised, it's like on 5.2 with the uh, uh, SAN statistics for the area, constituency area, 400, yep. 427 children living in the constituency with a Yorkshire funded EHC plan. Um, mm -hmm. So, and that's 13.9% of the North Yorkshire total. So it, it, it's we are doing a great job, um, and, and I've got to um, applaud you for what you're doing in these hard times. Um, but I do, you know, there's more to be done, and I, we, we have got to be very, very careful not to disrupt what excellent service we have. Um, so thank you for that. On the other side of things, um, previously I brought up about schools in financial difficulty, and as some members are aware. I've put myself forward as a governor in one of the local schools, primary schools in Whitby, and I've got a better understanding of what financial difficulties can um, put pressure on these schools, no matter whether it's secondary or whether it's primary. Um, there's a lot of pressure on these schools, and thank you for putting in the document um, 6.1 on page 24 um, as of March. 20, their overall position for North Yorkshire schools, um, 37 schools with accumulated deficits totaling 7.2 million. And that is a lot of money, and that's a lot of pressure on schools. And it just goes on in the bullet points. So this is a, um, and it got, and the number of schools in deficit from 2017-18 was 54. Uh, and up till 22, 23, it's going to be 93. And all the surplus places, what's available in these schools, um, it, it does make a big problem uh, for, for a lot of schools. And um, as time goes on, the pupil numbers drop, you get less finance. And that is a big concern for me because pupils do make the finance and it makes a school tick better than it is if it's got low numbers as I do know from first hand with what 
uh, I've been through with one of the local primary schools. So basically, that's a really big concern moving forward, and that's especially rural schools as well. Um, but then I'll come on to funding, which makes uh, it really, really important. Uh, and that's on the uh, same page, basically, school finances. So basically, um, funding in North York, 133 of 149, um, where we stand is 5,151 per pupil in 2021, and national it's 5.496. Um, and the primary average, that was secondary, sorry, and the primary average is 4.347 per pupil and national 4.27. This is a really, really big concern. And if we read the report and look at all the figures, the numbers, what stop it in the schools and the finances, what uh, the schools are finding themselves in and we're getting less money per pupil there's a big problem and I know uh, uh, the, the, the council do um, go through parliament and, and, and education ministers to put this for, to get a funding formula better for us but this proves to me we've got to do more um, to make sure that our pupil per pupil gets the funding like nationally end up like nationally. So I would suggest uh, if the committee members agree with me that on behalf of the committee, I would write to uh, our local MP, Robert Goodwill, and the Education Secretary, Gabby Williamson, to look at this report and to make representations higher up to make sure that we get the proper funding we deserve because the kids are our future, the pupils are our future, and we've got to make sure that we deliver um, better funding for these pupils to make better education for the future. And also we have, um, we've invited our MP Robert Goodwill to our next meeting in January. Um, hopefully that will be taken up. We can discuss it then, but hopefully we can invite um, Gavin Williamson as well, because he was, uh, he lived in Scarborough, and brought up in Scarborough. So I think it would be very good if we can have them both at our next meeting um, and to discuss the funding situation and this report, what's in front of us today, because it's a huge concern and especially where the times we're in today. I'm sorry for that going on a little bit, members, but I feel passionate about this and we've got to do as best as we can to make sure that fund is in place for the future for our children. I'd leave it at that. Thank you. And if anybody wants, uh, any staff or officers want to come back on that, just to um, uh, put, add, add anything to that, whether you agree or disagree, I'm, I, I, you know, I'm stood to be corrected, but uh, um, I would uh, appreciate it if anybody could come back on that. Uh, I, I think I, I can probably just add a, a brief comment. Um, Howard Emmett, Assistant Director, Strategic Resources. I think we would we would agree with that. Whilst there has been additional funding nationally for school school funding, um, I think we would still um, argue that rural schools, particularly uh, our small rural secondary schools, are um, are underfunded compared with um, larger um, larger urban schools. So. We, we have some secondary schools with maybe three, four or 500 um, pupils. They don't get the same economies of scale. The <laughs> offset requirements are still to deliver a broad curriculum and that becomes um, quite challenging. DfE, uh, I think in 2019, I think the first time recognised that they needed to do something around rur rurality and, and sparsity. We've seen a little bit of a movement for 21-22 in relation to primary schools in that respect. Um, uh, but sparsity is, it doesn't necessarily always equate to, to small. Um, but we've not seen any movement yet around, around secondary schools. So that, that remains, a, remains a concern. We understand that at, that at some point the DfE will consult on um, small and rural schools, but we're not quite sure when, and we're not sure what the proposals are. So, so I think we we still we still think that um, 
lobbying is required. It is a national funding formula, so we've got very little um, ability to uh, change that. The, the local discretion is around the minimum funding guarantee principally. Um, so we are we are administering a national scheme, and it's and it's whether that um, national one size fits all uh, funding formula is right for for North Yorkshire. But that but that is the system that that we're in at the moment. Um, I, I'm happy to accept that. Um, but as members, local members for this area, we've got to do all we can. Um, yes, there might be a consultation. We don't know what point is. But we need to put our points across before that even comes to that stage, yeah. uh, because I, I, I wouldn't be on my own with the concerns I've raised. Uh, and I think we have to do all we can to make sure that this area, not national, not anywhere else, we represent Scarborough and Whitby constituency. And we have to do all we can to make sure that our voices are heard, our representations are made to the right people. Uh, so thank, uh, thanks for that anyway, uh, Howard. Um, so we've got Councillor Jefferson, Councillor Colin and Councillor Jefferson. Sorry, am I first, Joe? Sorry. Sorry. Councillor Jefferson first. Uh, thank sorry. you. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you for the um, quick overview. First of all, I've got other questions, but first of all, I want to fully support Councillor Plant in what he's saying about finance. He knows he's a fellow member of the ONS on Young People Services. And we did look at this in, in our February meeting. It is a great concern. And, and we as an ONS, you know, we're bringing this back. And we do need some answers, especially within the Scarborough Whitby area. I'll agree with everything that Councillor Plant has said and support the whole of that. because so we do need to, to look at that. Uh, virtually all the things that we're looking at today we do bring on an annual basis to our ONS committee. And I would really like to thank the officers for all the work they have done over this last year, especially during COVID. I mean, and the, and the teachers and the staff have worked over and beyond their duty uh, to help with frontline staff, staff children. Um, I've got one or two things that comments, first of all. I'm pleased to see that within the area, our exclusions have reduced. And I think this is really uh, the ladder of intervention and this was brought to our uh, officers attention mainly by our ONS and a lot to do with our coastal areas because we are expected experiencing higher rates in this obviously the more children that are fixed term excluded are not learning and this was a great problem I'm pleased to see that we've had a reduction that is really really good and that tells you that when you're in school you can learn and I think that's one good thing. Um, my other concern, um, I could take on board all the items because I say we've scrutinised them. But one of the other things that I'm concerned about is the enhanced Main Street provision uh, with our primary schools in Scarborough. We've got the facilities in Whitby, but we seem to be minus this facility in Scarborough. Um, I have brought it up and we are looking at it through the ONS as to how we can adapt on this or whether children will have to travel to Whitby. I know it's situations. Um, I just want to also say, with, within our last ONS, we, did, we were privileged to see the draft of Education, Our Greatest Liberator. And um, within that, although on the coast we are improving, we still do have some serious issues, as Councillor Plant has alluded to. But the one good thing I think members maybe aren't aware of is that we are continuing the Coastal Opportunities Programme, which I think has been so beneficial to our coast, not least in school readiness, because we have a lot of children, unfortunately, from vulnerable families, who can't speak very well, can't proact, and it's really helped them in early years, and this hopefully will progress the development as we go through. And that's been really challenged by some of our uh, academy groups. The other thing I really want to bring up, and it's probably not the place here, but I put it within my statement, uh, looking ahead within the COVID um, restrictions and finance again. Um, Christmas is coming. Um, we know that. And we're concerned within our areas of provision for free school meals because we're going to get more and more people who are probably unemployed 
and have families. And I think we, we're looking, hopefully, to look at this, uh, to oversee this at a mid-cycle briefing. But I do know that there are some issues between Scarborough and Whitby with families, and that's just two of the things. I'll reserve the right to come back. But my main thing, I share the, the views of finance because I think that's really important. Um, and we are looking at it and looking forward within our agenda, but it's very, very prevalent within our coast and the rural areas, and we've got to look at that. And also the EMS provision and also caring for our vulnerable families under this COVID period. But thank you all very much for your support and all the work that you do. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Jefferson, can you just clarify, please? You said you reserved the right to come back. Um, well, it's just, just if, he, if he just says something that I want to question. Yeah, all well, right. every member's got that uh, right thank to come back much. after it's been answered. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Hi, it's um, Caroline Howe, Head of Inclusion again. Um, so just to, um, to comment again about those, um, the schools, we've, we've had to go with in order of the schools volunteering um, to come forward to be in um, targeted divisions. And we are confident that um, once those initial um, schools get started in Whitby, that it's, it becomes clear to other schools that this can be successful, that they're well supported, and we're really hoping that they'll step forward. Um, we really need, um, we really do need those volunteers in Scarborough as well. We're absolutely aware of that. Um, in the in the meantime, um, we've also we've still got services working from the new SEND hubs, which will be able to support those children in school, those schools in meeting the needs of those children. Um, in particular, this um, since September. Um, you've noted that the exclusions have fallen. Yes, we're absolutely delighted. We think the ladder of intervention is starting to, to work. We've also got a new um, a new rigorous weekly system within those sent hubs where we track exclusions and attendance at schools as well um, every week. And then we are back out to those schools looking at what's happening for those children is there something we can support with? In primary in particular, um, and working with um, our Scarborough Pupil Referral Service, we've got a new intensive support team for social, emotional um, and mental health service. So we can put in, um, you know, it's a team of mobile peripatetic specialists who we can put into a school to give some hands-on intensive support when they've got a child who's frequently being permanent and um, uh, fixed term excluded or at risk of permanent exclusion. So we've got that new team as well at the moment that's giving an enhanced level of support to what we had before. So I'm hoping that this term we're really starting to see the benefits of that. Um, thank you, uh, can, can I just uh, come back a point, uh, Councillor Jefferson raised about free school meals? I did bring that up earlier um, with the, uh, some members of the executive and there is a local assistant fund. I believe that's what you call it. Uh, Councillor Chance might uh, uh, just come in on that one, if that's correct, uh, Councillor Chance. Yes, uh, thanks, Chairman. Yeah. Uh, where do I start with this one? Um, yes, um, the DEFRA grant which we got, um, £54,000 was given uh, out to um, um, food banks, etc., within Scarborough and Whitby. Um, Rainbow Centre got 10000 Revival North Yorkshire got seven. Kafka got ten. Age UK got ten. Chamonby Food Bank got two, which is, uh, they asked for four, but they got two because they tried to spread it over two years and it could only be done for one year. Salvation Army got 5000 uh, Whitby Food Alliance got 10000 Food for Whitby declined any money, said they had plenty. Uh, and on top of that, uh, we've had uh, 15, 20, 21,000 has gone in from, um, from local members uh, from their locality budgets. So yes, we have done our bit there. And in addition to that, we've increased the, um, uh, the uh, North Yorkshire um, um, 
the Nile Aft Fund, sorry, my brain is going here. Um, that's been increased uh, as well, and we've increased the number of payments that people can make, uh, and they can apply direct. They used to have to come through agents before, but they can apply direct now as well. So there, there is money there for anyone who's in crisis. Uh, thanks, Councillor Chance, for that update. Um, I'm sure members will take that on board, what's been done. And can I also say a big thank you to all the businesses as well who's come out in support of making sure that children uh, do get um, something to eat. Um, but we, we are, a, a, as I said previously, we've been rated outstanding for Mofsted in all services of young people uh, services. And we can't ignore that. And the less disruption, and I'll keep going on about it, the less disruption we have to this service at this critical time, the better for these young children. And it helps the families as well. So I'd just like to say thank you to everybody who's made that possible. And I hope everybody uh, will take on board what's been done from a lot of people. Um, and, and, and it is targeted. That's one thing I must say, it is targeted for these people who will have no meals. And we've got to make sure all we can do uh, is that they have a meal. One thing I would like to add on that as well is, and, and I'm not sure uh, with this local assistant fund, uh, it was my point was, and, and I'm pleased that um, the council put a media release out about this fund, because as I understand it, not many people would know about the local assistant fund. So the more um, media uh, uh, media um, stuff goes out on this, the better for everybody, and at least they'll know where to go. I'm going to stop there, and I'm going to go on to Councillor Liz Colley. Could uh, with your with your permission, could I just come back on something there, Chairman, that you said? All right, sorry. And uh, that is, I, I will say that the the local assistance, the North Yorkshire Local Assistance Fund, is well known to those organisations who are working within the community uh, because they've always referred into it. So yes, it's, it, it is known. So all, all your uh, community organisations know about it as well and they refer into it regularly. Uh, and for those organisations who, thank you for that update, David, um, uh, but for those organisations to know about these people, those people have to contact them. Uh, and that's the point I'm trying to make, is, is make sure that everybody is aware of that fund. Um, Councillor Lewis Collin. Uh, Councillor Collin, are we there? Sorry, here I am, yes. <laughs> uh, apologies. Um... My camera's not working, which might be a blessing this morning. So you've just got my voice, I'm afraid. Um, I'd like to talk about educational health care plans, please. But before I do, can I thank everyone for the support for Springhead Sixth Form going to the former Raincliffe site? I think that's really good news for provision um, in Scarborough, certainly. Um, my concerns about educational health care plans are um, a couple of questions, please. How long from referral to the plan getting set up? How long do we have to wait for that? Um, and the second part is, and I must declare an interest here, I am a trustee of um, Childhaven and it's an advert, it's an outstanding state maintained nursery in Scarborough. But what is the process for preschools and other early care settings instigating the process of an educational health care plan so that when a child presents at primary school, everything can be in place for them? Thank you. Hi, I can take that one again, Caroline Howe. Um, thank you for the opportunity to clarify that. Absolutely, our earlier settings can initiate um, requests for education, health and care plans, and we actively encourage them to do so for those children where it's really clear that they're going to have significant need when they get to primary school. Um, and I'm thinking, you know, obviously in early years, um, the range of, of typical development is huge. So we have some children who seem quite delayed early on, but then with really good early years support, such as they'll receive at Haven, then they close that gap and um, 
don't need support. But when it's obvious, we know those early years practitioners are skilled and can tell the difference. Um, those kids whose needs are going to be long term and persistent, we actively encourage them to, to make a request. Um, it's at our early years SENCO networks um, where we answer those kind of questions for settings and are able to help, you know, share those messages about that. Those meetings are still um, part of our core free offer for settings. Um, so we do regular communication out and support to settings to encourage them to do that. Um, the process is um, from um, the full process is 20 weeks. Um, and that's one of those processes that's um, statutorily laid down. Um, it's, it's specified by, um, by law because we need to give our colleagues in health, um, in particular, enough time to respond to a request and to give their advice. So there's no way of us reducing that 20 weeks. Um, under normal operating procedures in North Yorkshire, um, in, the, in the very recent past, we're really proud that the majority of our plans are completed well within that 20 weeks. And at the moment, we've been delayed by COVID, not least because our colleagues in health have been redeployed elsewhere. So um, we've not been able to get the information back in time from health. And so we've not been delivering on time. We're closing that gap now um, and catching up. There is still some delay in the system, um, but we will catch back up again with those. But that full process is 20 weeks. We are often asked if we can fast track in a crisis um, because it's a statutory length of process. That's not something we can do. But we know that um, we, what we can do is we can put some interim support in for settings. We can help out if they're struggling until a plan comes through um, in terms of hands on support. Um, but we can't rush that process, I'm afraid. May I come back, Chair? please. Um, so uh, understand the process. Would be interested to know what percentage um, last year didn't meet the 20 weeks. I accept that this year is really different. Um, yeah. And back to early year settings, with making the referral, what percentage of our children start primary school with an EHC plan in place? So to, to demonstrate that the early year settings are working, they've initiated the request and that when they start the school in, whether they're September or April intake, the plan is there ready and waiting for them. And I think we'd all agree that early years are really, really important for children. We've got some big attainment gaps to close. Thank you. Um, I can completely agree with that. Um, we know we do have some difficulties. We've had some settings that haven't initiated that process in enough time for the 20 weeks to be completed before children start in school. And again, that's something we're promoting with settings, um, particularly if it looks like a child that's going to need to go to special school. Um, so, yeah, children that are going to need to go to special school, we keep saying that, that needs to be done sooner. Our early years specialists who are working from the centre are advising early years settings um, to get those requests in in plenty of time so that we do make sure they're delivered on time. It would be difficult to, to be able to say how many, um, what percentage are achieved by reception start, because we do get children that, that um, their difficulties haven't been as immediately apparent until later within the year. So perhaps they start school without that fully in place because the setting didn't initiate it. So not through a fault in the system, rather than that, child, the severity of that child's needs weren't as immediately apparent. We absolutely can um, provide figures on the numbers of plans that have been provided on time over time. Um, so that's something I can provide after the meeting, not a problem. During COVID, um, the legislation requiring us to deliver in 20 weeks was completely relaxed. That's now back on. So I'll be able to provide data for pre-COVID, during and after, if that's helpful. That's very helpful. Thank you. I love me a bit of data. Thank you very much, <laughs> Chair. I can do that. Uh, thank you. Uh, we'll move on to Councillor David Chepples. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, 
two brief points I want to uh, to make. First of all, referring to your earlier comments about rural schools, I think this really is uh, an important issue because um, I think it embraces the the whole uh, rurality uh, question uh, of uh, North Yorkshire and uh, uh, similar local authorities uh, nationwide. Because if we see uh, uh, rural schools uh, put under threat uh, of closure, that's going to be bad uh, for um, many, many families because it's going to uh, result in uh, increased travelling um, to, uh, to uh, neighbouring schools. Uh, and at the same time, I think it's, uh, it has a very detrimental effect on um, rural, on rural communities uh, as uh, as a whole. Um, so I would certainly go along with your uh, with your uh, assertion that we should uh, involve uh, our our MPs uh, and get the the message over to to Westminster. And I think a case should all, could also be made to the LGA. Um, uh, so far as uh, rural schools uh, are, are, con are concerned, um, because of the burden that it would it would closure of schools and due to to uh, the, the lack of funding uh, would have a, certainly a serious detrimental effect. Um, the second point I wanted to make was um, in relation to um, pupil referral units, the PR PRUs. Um, I understand that uh, certainly in, in the Scarborough one that there have been um, or are being um, cuts made there in terms of, of personnel. And I think this is a, a retrograde step um, because um, certainly at the present time, there's probably a greater need for them, for these uh, people, people referral units um, with, um, with, with the COVID um, issues uh, and um, the uncertainty uh, of the economy uh, in, the, in the future, which is going to impact on families. Uh, and uh, I, I do think that we should be uh, enhancing that service rather than rather than, than, than cutting back. I know certainly so far as the Scarborough one is concerned, it's held in very high regard. I've been there myself and, and, and seen it and been extremely impressed. With the with the way it is run and the splendid work that they they do, so I do hope that um, the P the, the pupil referral units can be uh, taken on board and uh, given the level of funding that they that they deserve. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, uh, Councillor Jeffold. Does anybody want to come in on what Councillor Jeffels Jeffels has said? Um, yes, um, Caroline Howe again, I can respond about um, PRS. Um, just to say that absolutely um, I agree, um, Scarborough um, PRS in particular um, is, is outstanding and we're working with them to actually extend some of their offer at the moment, particularly supporting children in primary. Um, so although I think what you what you're noting is an adjustment to their funding that took place in the last financial year. Um, so there has been adjustment to funding in the last year, but there's absolutely no intensive services that's coming from the PRS. In fact, we're wanting to work with them in more depth. Um, it's a you know an excellent service. Thank you very much, Carol. Thank you. Um, thank you um, for that. Is uh, are there any other members who wish to speak, please? Okay, uh, we'll leave it at that. And again, can I thank everybody involved in what you're doing? Uh, and again, especially in these hard times, thank you for the report. Very hard to go forward, and it's going to be very difficult for a lot of people. And again, thank you very much. Uh, for all what the services do in the education side of things. So thank you very much indeed. Oh, sorry, can I just, just add one thing uh, to the report on that is um, the school at which I was a governor, um, St Hilda's um, Roman Catholic Primary School um, has started a consultation for the proposal to close it. Um, and, it's, and that consultation started on the uh, 2nd of November. 
It will close on the 14th of December. There will be a virtual public meeting on the 24th of November and the executive will make the final decision um, on March the 21st. So that's just to, if you go through your report again, that is to add to that. So um, I just thought I'd just update members on that. Uh, Councillor Randerson wishes to speak. Uh, yes, yes, Chair. Uh, just to ask uh, Matt a quick question, and you'll probably be aware what it's going to be it's regarding the uh, new Overdale School. Is everything on, on song for that, Matt? Uh, it's up, going to be up and running for September for the intake. Uh, can you give us an update just to uh, clarify things? Thanks, Chair. Uh, yeah, thanks, Councillor Anderson. Uh, I, I'll just take my hand down. I, I, I've, I've got a comment in response to Councillor Plant as well, but I'll just respond to Councillor Anderson um, first. Uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're pleased with the developments at Middle Deepdale, um, just north of East, well, the northern part of Eastfield, where we're building a replacement school for Overdale. Um, they're on site and in they've been working throughout the COVID period, the, the developers there, uh, in a obviously a COVID secure way and the announcement last week hasn't changed that uh, because building work can continue um, so at the moment we're, we're on track uh, to open for September next year uh, obviously in these times we can never say for 100% definite with any restrictions that might be put in place in the future but uh, at the moment it's looking very very positive for, for delivery for next year and I know the school are getting getting quite excited um, we're hoping to do some visits for the pupils up to the site once uh, once this period of intense lockdown is is over. We'd actually started planning that, but obviously we're taking a step back now because of the uh, the change in plans um, from from this weekend. Uh, so I hope that answers Councillor Randerson's question. Uh, I, I had my hand up initially just to just to raise the point that Councillor Plant has, has just said there. The report um, says because of the time at which it was written that the, that we're reviewing um, the closure proposal at St Hilda's. Obviously, that is now out to consultation. Um, so I just echo what Councillor Plant said. And if there anybody um, members in that area should have been made aware on Monday, um, mm -hmm. but. Um, just just to encourage people to respond to that consultation. Um, all the details are online and uh, I can be contacted if you need any more information. Thanks. Um, thank, thank you very much for that, Matt. It, uh, it sounds very promising. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Matt, for that and, and, and to everybody who's taken part um, in delivering this report. So thanks again. Um, we're going to agenda item number seven, which is the work programme. Uh, Melanie, if you want to say a few words. Uh, Melanie, you're on mute. Thank you. Apologies for that. Yeah, sorry. So you will have all seen the work programme document within the agenda pack. Um, there have been some, as, as a result of some of the discussions here today, obviously there are some things to add. So I noted that for the January meeting, we have the MP, but you also wanted to invite somebody else along with him. And I have made a note of the name. We're Gavin Williamson. And also, we have agreed that in March we would have um, an update on the bathing water from Yorkshire Water. That's so correct. We'll be adding those two. Yeah, what bathing water was for March. Yeah. Um, and, and I think what we said about uh, uh, MP Robert Goodwill and Gavin Williamson. We also have that January meeting on the 20th, I believe it is, Melanie. Yeah, that's the January meeting. Um, but obviously, if the MP, we, we need the MPs there because it is a budget meeting as well. And what time to have the MPs there to make representations to them. Um, but if if we have to change the date on that, um, we'll, you know, is there any scope in, in changing the date or would that be the set date? It's just so we can fit the MPs in. I have no reason to believe that that date wouldn't be appropriate, but um, obviously if there was a problem with the MP attending, then we can look to change that meeting date. 
Okay, thank you. So if members keep an eye on that, please, um, that will be uh, that will be good. Uh, Councillor Colin. Uh, right. Uh, just before Councillor Colin comes in, I think the other part of the work programme was I uh, talked to um, Councillor John Ennis of Scrutiny of Health, and uh, and he's spoken to Simon Cox, um, and which in turn has spoken to Daniel, I believe, uh, that we're going to try and get these um, Simon Cox to one of our meetings. I'm sure it won't be January because obviously that's going to be an important meeting. So maybe. We could arrange that for March, Melanie, uh, for Simon Cox to come in and talk about um, Scarborough Hospital, especially. OK, thank you, Chair. Um, if I press my microphone, I'd have said that before you because that's exactly the issue. One of the issues I was going to raise um, it's about the services review on the East Coast. I did get the impression because I was also on that chat with Simon Cox that it would be early in the new year and they would like to update us on particularly on stroke and oncology. Um, and I'm not sure whether I think it might be helpful for um, the MP to be involved in those conversations as well, because <clears throat> it clearly is a, a, a big issue. And the second thing, and I, I don't want to restart the conversation that I know members have already had about free school meals, but I do share some concerns about the local assistance fund. Um, not that it's not doing wonderful work, but people's ability to access it. And I wondered if I could ask we, we, if we could have a report particularly around that aspect of our offer to uh, families in difficulty. Um, how much NILAF access has there been and the distribution of that access, if that's OK? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Colin. I'm sure that's going to be fine. Uh, Councillor Chance. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, just uh, I'll join Liz when I come back on the, the Scarborough Hospital situation. Um, I initiated the um, the, the um, discussion with uh, Scrutiny of Health because I picked up the um, uh, CQC report on Scarborough Hospital, which just happened, uh, fortunately for them, to be released the same day as we went into lockdown and got lost in all the press. Um, and it was quite it was quite a damning report. Uh, so I, I passed it through uh, to John Ennis for his attention. What also concerns me is, uh, you know, it's all very well looking at, at the things they want to look at. But I think the one thing we need to look at is morbidity rates at Scarborough Hospital, because it's my understanding um, during the uh, pandemic, the, the first batch, uh, they, they had 28 people in uh, ICU and 98% died uh, and the one who didn't die died of a heart attack two weeks later. So I think we need to we need to be questioning them on morbidity rates as well during uh, COVID. Uh, not exactly uh, a, a glowing, uh, a glowing um, um, accolade for them at all, I'm afraid. Uh, and I would like to see us dig a little deeper than just looking at oncology. Um, Liz, if, if you want to have a word with me, I'm quite happy to pass on to you uh, any details you want about uh, NILAF. Um, I, I, I do have the, the details available to me. Um, thank you, uh, David, for coming in there. But can I also say as well how disappointed I am about the um, uh, information we receive uh, about Scarborough Hospital um, because it was his committee um, and I'm happy School New York Health um, take things on board and move things forward but not all members in, uh, of this committee can make School New York Health meetings because of, the, uh, of other meetings going on and I've got to say it's been disappointing you know, in what we what information we do get from Scarborough Hospital itself and I think it's important for these members to, to stay, and that's why I push for the area committee to get somebody from the NHS to our area committee so all our members of this committee can ask questions to them. And, and so they understand where we are as well. Uh, and, and, and I'm happy that Scrutiny Health do take things on board, but I believe that this committee has a part to play in making sure that our residents 
get the very best of care and more ever so than basic care. And if they don't receive that, then it's up to this committee to challenge them, to take them to task, to make sure that all our members of our uh, constituency get the right care they need at the right time. And it hasn't been good enough, the information we've been receiving about Scarborough Hospital, when this committee actually said we would like updates. And this was only last year, it was before the COVID, so no excuses there. And we've never received hardly anything from Scarborough Hospital. And I have pushed, and Council Pearson has pushed as well, we've made sure that we try and get these here. So I am disappointed, I've got to put that on record, I am disappointed. It's about local members knowing all the facts, what's in front of them, so they can challenge the NHS locally, not regionally, not nationally, locally. Um, I'll, I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, um, but if anybody else has got anything to say, please. Councillor Baston and I have noticed you've got your hands up. Thank you, Chairman. Just briefly, um, I endorse everything you say, and uh, Chairman, more than happy to include it on a scrutiny board meeting. If, and I think that's the ideal place to discuss it with other scrutiny chairs as well. And then if there are other concerns throughout the area, um, that it can be brought to the fore there. So uh, I know Daniel um, or, or Melanie may well include it for our next scrutiny board meeting agenda, Chairman, if that's uh, happy with you. I'm happy with that, if members are happy with that too. OK, thank you, Councillor Basserman. Thank you, Chairman. Any other questions, please? Um, Chair, can I just come back on, on that issue? Um, so, I, as you know, I sit on scrutiny of health. I have to say uh, the staff are very, very happy at Scarborough Hospital and York Foundation Trust, very happy indeed to come to area committees. Um, and I really counsel against us postponing them from January and, and know that our agendas, agendas are full. But I think we're almost at the stage where there's so much to talk about, whether it's the new build, whether it's the seat, the report or whether it's changes to services that we could almost have them as a standing item on every meeting <clears throat> and that would really keep the pressure up I think. Um, uh, uh, thank you uh, Liz for that and I, and I totally agree with that and, and they're quite happy to come along um, but like I say before Covid they had that chance to uh, and they never did so um, it, happy to it doesn't mean to say that they will do so hopefully as members of our committee, we can keep the pressure. Uh, Councillor Chance, you wanted to come back? No, you got your hand up. Sorry, Chairman, I just forgot to take it down. All right, OK. <laughs> uh, right, OK. Um, has anybody else got anything to add to the meeting today for the work programme? OK, you, you've got the uh, schedule for the next meetings. Uh, Melanie, can you just uh, update the public as well for those meetings? Yeah, will do. OK, uh, OK, then um, I'll do that then. So it's Wednesday, 20th of January at 10.30 a.m. Oh. And Wednesday, 17th of March at 10.30 a.m. 2021. Thank you very much much everybody for joining the meeting today hope you're all well keep safe and keep smiling thank you very much thank you joe thank you joe